Salvation. That's a big word. It's a huge topic. And there are a lot of questions we could ask. There are a lot of directions that we could go, but there's one place we can go that can answer all questions and that can give the direction. That, ladies and gentlemen, is if you and I, if we will open the Bible and ask the question, what is salvation? And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to open up our Bibles, look at scriptures, and ask the question, what is salvation? Uh, to do this, we're going to do five things together. We're going to recognize that salvation is needed. You need it, I need it, and we're going to see the root cause of why we need it. We're also going to notice that it has a location. Salvation is found in a specific place. And boy, we need to find that out today. But then also we need to rest assured today that salvation is something that can be obtained. You can have it, I can have it, and we can know that we have it. But don't rest easy too much. Salvation can be lost. We can choose to walk away from God. Choice has been a big discussion in our Open the Bible series, and you're going to talk about choice today. And then finally, what happens when we become saved? What happens when we walk away from salvation? Can we regain it again? Well, we need to know that it can be repaired. All of this done as we ask the question, what is salvation by opening the Bible? Let's start off by talking about how it is needed, and you need to know you need it, and I need to know that I need it. And I want to go to Genesis 2, 16 and 17, and look at Adam and Eve and see them. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die." Here we have Adam, and God is directly talking to Adam. He's communicating and commanding to Adam, here's what you can do, but here is where you must abstain. If you'll allow me to paraphrase, God says, leave it alone. And Adam understands what God has in store for him. Eve understands as you read the rest of this out what is in store for her. Mankind has been created. Mankind has been made complete in the relationship between man and woman. And life has begun. But it's not long after this that Adam and Eve make a decision to walk away from the commandments of God. And they find out the same thing they found out in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. When they ate of the produce of that tree, they will surely die. Their lives are now on lock. Their souls are now in need of a Savior. They have physically and spiritually started a problem because they chose to walk away from the Almighty God. We need to understand from since the beginning of mankind, from Adam and Eve all the way to you and all the way into the future, that man needs salvation. But it is God who cares for man. And that's where Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 comes into our minds. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your inquiries have separated, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Ladies and gentlemen, sin is the problem. There is a problem that you and I face. It has to do with our decisions. It has to do with our desires. It has to do with our lives. It is sin. But I want you to know this. God's hand is not so small. It's not so pulled back that he cannot save. His ear is not so closed up or burdened by other things that he cannot hear. But it is our iniquities. It is our sins that have separated us between God. Salvation, ladies and gentlemen, is needed. It is needed because of the problem of sin. And we don't like the word sin because sin means I've got a problem. Sin means you have a problem, but boy, it's deeper than that. Sin means I've messed it up and was wrong, and, and sin means you have messed it up and you were wrong, and no one likes to admit that they were wrong. But you and I need to understand that God is not so far away that He cannot hear. God is not so far away that He cannot save. We need to be assured that we need salvation and it is our sin that is the problem and God has made a plan for everyone 
Now remember the sin, remember the problem, remember the issue that we're talking about. It's Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God created Adam and Eve. God created mankind, manhood in a perfect environment. They were perfect and without sin, they were perfect. And God's going to bring us back to perfection. God's going to bring us back to that glory of which He's given. We've fallen short of Him. And we need to rest assured today. We need to know, we need to be satisfied in our minds that we are a people who need salvation. But we also need to know where it's at. It has a location. And here's the first thing I want you to see when it comes to the location of salvation. We cannot find salvation in riches. Psalm 49, 6 and 7. Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them by any means can redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. It is not money that will save. Uh, you, you and I live very blessed lives. Many people in the world live blessed lives. That doesn't mean all people live blessed lives. I know there are some people who are very rich, and I know some people that are very poor, and, and I know people that are right in the middle. But no matter who you are, no matter how much you have or you do not have, you cannot take what you have in riches and wealth, and you cannot give it to God for your brother nor for yourself as a ransom for you. When we ask the question, what is salvation? We need to know it cannot be purchased. You cannot take your funds. You cannot take your wealth. You cannot take your resources. You cannot take your mind and develop your own personal salvation. We cannot find it in riches. We cannot find salvation, number two, in animal sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. The Old Testament was built on sacrifices. But they were building to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And it was not the animal sacrifices that the Old Testament was looking forward to. Nor can you and I sacrifice anything in order to have our salvation. We cannot reach into the Old Testament like those of the little g-gods and sacrifice our children. We cannot sacrifice our animals. We cannot sacrifice anything in this life in the regard of it and alone will save us. We cannot find salvation in animal sacrifices. But salvation has a location. We cannot find salvation in our own works. Ephesians 2.9 Not of works lest anyone should boast. You see, God knew what He was doing. And God still knows what He's doing. And God will know what He's doing. And you and I probably, if you'll allow me to be real open and honest and, and, and just quite frank with my words, if we could find a workaround, we probably would try that. And if we could say, oh, look at what I've done. This is enough. That's probably what we might do. But God knows what we need. We need salvation. We cannot find salvation in our own paths. Jeremiah 10, 23, oh, Lord. I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Our own ideas, our own philosophies, our own mindsets, it's not going to bring you into salvation. But when you and I open up God's Word, we can find what will bring us to salvation. Here's the truth. Salvation is found in Christ. It is in Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us. It's 1 Peter 1.19, the precious blood of Christ. It is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ. The location of salvation is in Christ. And you can find all spiritual blessings in Christ. Redemption, love, the body, sanctification, reconciliation, liberty, power, purpose, rejoicing, grace. You can find every blessing inside of Christ. It is only inside of Christ of which salvation is found. Notice with me 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Christ Jesus might show all long suffering 
as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Paul says, I'm the chief, I'm the worst of the worst, and Christ saved me. It's only in Christ. It wasn't in Saul, it wasn't in Paul, it wasn't in his world. 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16 tells me salvation is inside of Christ. But 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14 tells me the same. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which He called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is only found in Christ. And you and I need to rest assured that it can be obtained. You can have it today. You can leave today and know that you are redeemed. You can walk in your day and know that you are saved. You can go on in your life and know that heaven is your home. But you've got to be the one who follows Jesus. Now what I want you to do is I want you to open your Bibles and I want you to ask this question secondarily to our question today. And I want you to ask the question of what must I do to be saved? I want you to go to the book of Acts. And I want you to open that book and I want you to read it. And I want you to see what people did to be saved. Because if we can do what they did, we will be what they were. You can have salvation. It has a location that is in Christ. But not only that, we need to know that salvation, it can be lost. Salvation is conditional. Uh, we're going to look at Matthew 18, 21 through 35, the unforgiving servant. And Matthew 25, 1 through 13, the 10 virgins to understand that it is conditional. It's in Matthew 18, 21 through 35 where we read about the unforgiving servant. We read in verse 34, And his master was angry and he delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. W what's going on here in Matthew 18? Uh, what's happening with this servant who was unwilling to forgive? Well, in Matthew 18, 21 through 35, there was a servant who owed a sum and he couldn't pay it, but his master forgave him his debt. But it just so happened that someone owed him a debt and he would not forgive that debt. This servant, who was unforgiving, had been forgiven all and he could not forgive. And therefore, he was sent to the torturers because he would not forgive until he repay all that was due to him. And here's the illustration of the debt he owed. It was more than a lifetime of which he could repay. He could never repay it. That's a key earmark for you and I to know that we might not keep our salvation due to our deeds in this life. But one of the greatest ways, one of the greatest scenes that comes is in Matthew 25, 1 through 13, where the ten virgins... There were five who were wise and five who were foolish, and, and they had to prepare themselves for the bridegroom who was coming. They were called to the feast, this great scene of rejoicing, this great scene of relaxation, this great scene of hope. And they had to get themselves to the feast. And it happened in this occasion, if you'll read in verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, that the bridegroom tarried. Didn't get there when they thought he was going to come. But the bridegroom comes later on in the verses and the wise, they, they trim their lamps and they replenish their oil. But the foolish, they didn't bring enough oil. They didn't bring enough to get through the journey. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what you and I are trying to do. We're trying to get through the journey to heaven. And I've got to bring enough with me. I've got to put enough in me, not of my own works, but of God and His Word and His principles and His standards so that I can endure the journey. So the wise told the foolish, you go find your own oil. We're going to go in. We've got to go meet the bridegroom. And it just so happens that the door was shut. And listen to what happens in verse 11 and 12. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. They had everything they needed. They were on the right path. They loved their master. They loved their Lord. They wanted to see the bridegroom. They knew him by name. Lord, Lord, open to us. But he didn't know them because they didn't survive the journey. Salvation 
is conditional. And here's what I want you to know, and it's what I want me to know. It can be lost. So take your salvation seriously. Take heaven seriously. And thus, let's talk about something. Because salvation should be discussed. And you and I need to understand that we can repair when we mess everything up. I want you to think about two sets of passages with me. I want to go to James 5 and I want to go to Galatians 6 to make an illustration that salvation can be repaired. At James 5, 16 and verse 20, Confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you might be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now I know we're going to go down to verse 20, so let's go ahead and read it now. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Two things I want you and I to know. Number one, James 5, 16. When you and I are living in trespasses sin, we need to be willing to say, I need you to pray for me. Because James 5, 16 says that we might be healed. Then it says this, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. God has made it so that you and I, with our brethren, can be redeemed again and again and again. God has made it so that prayers for us can be heard. God has made it so that we can come back to Him. And here's what I want you to know. There's no shame in coming back. So many times we're afraid to admit that we're wrong. I don't like to admit when I'm wrong. You don't like to admit when you're wrong. We don't like to see that our family was wrong. We don't like to see that sin has entered the door. But there are times when we need prayers. And that's where verse 20 comes into our minds. Let him know that he who turns the sinner from the air of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. We need to be willing, ladies and gentlemen, to talk to one another about our lives. Because salvation needs to be discussed. I need your help. And you need mine. We are trying to survive this journey of life to heaven together and we need one another to help each other along the way. That means when I see you and when you see me, we need to help each other. We need to let each other know that heaven's the most important place and that there's nothing in this life that's worth it. We need to let each other know that I want to go to heaven with you and you want to go to heaven with me and there's nothing that's going to get in our way. I'm not going to let my opinions get in the way. You're not going to let yours. I'm not going to let my ways get in the way. You're not going to let yours. We're going to let these little problems that come up in life get in the way because heaven is worth it, because salvation should be discussed. But here's something that's true, and we just don't like it. That word trespass in James 5, 16 is also a word used in Galatians 6, 1 and 2 and also connected to us in verse 10, a passage we need to know. Let's read both of them. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. 1 and 2. Here's 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. We are told, ladies and gentlemen, to do good. Well, what's it mean to do good? Well, to be nice and to be kind. Oh, it's so much more than that. To help the sick and help the needy, help the orphans and help the widows. Oh, it's much more than that. To go to church and be a good Christian. It is so much more than your attendance. Doing good. Following the opportunity means... And I'm going to look to you, and you're going to look to me, and we're going to go to heaven together. Verses 1 and 2, brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, I want you to change that word, in sin. In any sin, I should be willing and you should be willing to help restore such a one. Now listen to this, in the spirit of gentleness, you know what you want to be told when you're wrong. I know what I want to be told when I'm wrong. But so many times we'll go to one another and say, you messed it up. We'll concoct this great story to make others feel bad. That's not what's here in Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Gentleness. Gentleness. 
to restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Now listen to this. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And then listen to this verse, verse 2. Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What are the burdens? The burdens are sin. And we need to help one another be willing to come to prayer, to come to repentance, come to restoration. And in that, there's verse 10. I want you to see it. We know what we need to do. And if we have the opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. If you're a Christian today, I want you to hear something. And if you're not a Christian today, I want you to hear something. If you're a Christian, you should be looking at your world and you should be looking at your brethren, but you should especially be looking at your brethren because we should have that relationship one to another. It should already be built. If you're looking at those that are not Christians and you should be building relationship in roads to have the conversations with them about their souls. If you're not a Christian today, I want you to consider becoming a Christian today. Find someone to talk to. Find a member of the Church of Christ. Go find a Church of Christ and go talk with them. And go open the Bible. Because that's where the answers are found. If you're not a Christian today, read your Bible. Just, just find it for yourself. And what you will find is what we have found and what others need to find is that God cares for us, that salvation can be discussed. You see, once we obtain it, we've got to keep it. I've got to keep living. I've got to keep coming back to the Lord because following Him matters. It can be repaired. You see, it's needed. It has a location. It can be obtained. It can be lost. It can be repaired. And all of that is involved in the question, what is salvation? I hope that in this study, we found what salvation is. We've seen that it is the forgiveness. It is the, the reconciliation of our sins through Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ. And it is the living as we continually come back to Him, as we survive and stand on Him. And I hope that we recognize today that if we will open the Bible, we will find the questions and we will find the answers that everyone wants to know. 